It has been said that the brain will be to the 21st century what the atom was to the 20th century. Tonight, we continue our exploration of this fascinating organ with our second Charlie Rose Brain series. In our first season, we studied brain science. This year, we expand our journey to provide a parallel view of brain disorders. For each program and for each disorder, scientists and researchers who have studied the disease from both a medical and scientific perspective will join us. We will discuss certain disorders with patients. Some of them are physicians who speak about their illnesses both medically and privately. And finally, we'll explore how our increasing knowledge of brain disorders has enriched our understanding of the human mind. For tonight's inaugural episode of our second series, we study how neurological, psychiatric, and addictive disorders all result from disturbances in different neural systems. Our understanding of brain disorders has evolved greatly throughout history. Two centuries ago, mental illness was believed to be a disease of the mind, not the brain. Those suffering from psychiatric disorders were thought to have defects in their moral integrity. In an attempt to toughen them, they were subjected to crude and inhuman treatments such as bleedings or even torture. As time progressed, though, the perception and treatment of psychiatric and addictive disorders changed dramatically. In the last 40 years, a synthesis between neuroscience and cognitive psychology has helped us understand the mind as a series of functions carried out by the brain. Genetic research and the development of brain imaging have clearly revealed psychiatric and addictive disorders to be biological disorders. Today, we stand on the brink of a new era in brain study. Joining me now to discuss where we are now and where we are going are a remarkable group of scientists. Gerald Fishback is a professor at Columbia University and the scientific director of the Simons Foundation Autism Project. Thomas Ensel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health at the NIH. Nora Valko, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the NIH. And Cornelia Bargman, a professor at Rockefeller University. And once again, my co-host is Dr. Eric Kandel. As you know, he is a Nobel laureate, a professor at Columbia University, and a Howard Hughes medical investigator. We begin our program with the question, what are the similarities and differences of various brain disorders? In this series, we're going to consider various brain disorders. And as you know, the brain is the most complicated organ in the body and therefore susceptible to more diseases than any other organ. And we're going to begin by considering psychiatric addictive and neurological disorders, which encompasses all brain disorders. We're going to ask the question, what are the similarities and differences between them? Now, this is an issue that has been discussed for decades, and the thinking about it can be divided into sort of three phases. The first phase, which is perhaps best called the moral phase, uh, continued until around 1800, when many physicians thought that only neurological diseases are based in the brain, that psychiatric disorders and addictive disorders were not brain disorders, they were weaknesses of character, mm. moral disorders. Uh, and people with addictive and psychiatric diseases were isolated from the rest of the community, put into asylums, put in chains, and often treated very, very harshly. Uh, needless to say, not only was this inhumane, but it was counterproductive. And then the situation changed when a great French physician, 1800, Philippe Pinel, came along, and he changed things dramatically. Uh, he asserted very strongly that psychiatric diseases and addictive diseases are medical disorders. They're not weaknesses of character, uh, and that they need to be treated in a humane fashion. Uh, he removed the chains of people in Salpetriere, the great uh, Paris psychiatric hospital, uh, and he began to get patients to talk to him about their problems and to interact with each other, almost the beginning of psychotherapy and group therapy. And he had the notion that psychiatry is a subspecialty of medicine. These are all medical disorders. And he had the foresight to say these diseases are likely to occur in people who have a genetic predisposition who put under social or personal stress. This had an amazing impact in the field. The next phase, which began around 1860, uh, began with a guy called uh, Pierre Paul Broca. This is the anatomical phase. Exactly. You know this stuff better than I do, for God's sakes. <laughs> no, you should change positions. 
<laughs> just watching. <laughs> uh, I'm a good student. <laughs> <laughs> better than that. Uh, he was interested in a particular brain disorder called aphasia, disorder of language, and he was interested whether that could be localized in the brain. And he found first one and then a group of patients who had a specific form of language disorder. They could understand language perfectly well, but they couldn't express themselves in language. And when they died and came to autopsy, he found that invariably they had a lesion in the left side of the brain, mm. and it was in the front of the brain. Um, but 15 years later, Carl Wernicke, a German neurologist, picked up the study of aphasia, and he found a patient who had the mirror image clinical picture. He could articulate, could express language, but couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. When he died and came to autopsy, he had a lesion also on the left side, and the lesion was at the back of the brain. Uh, moreover, he realized that the lesion of his patient and Broca's patients, those two areas, now called Wernicke's area and Broca's area, are interconnected. That made him realize that complex neurological disorders are not due to a lesion at one site, but a lesion at a number of sites that are interconnected. Mm -hmm. People now began to explore a number of neurological diseases, and Jerry Fishback is going to speak about that, and saw that all of them could be localized to one or more areas in the brain, neural circuitry in the brain. When psychiatrists began to explore the brain for psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, depression, addiction, they didn't find obvious lesions in the brain. And so many thought that these are not brain-based disorders, these are mental disorders. And a few far-sighted psychiatrists realized even early that it's very likely that they are brain disorders, but undetectable with the techniques then available. Uh, the situation changed remarkably in the last 40 years. A new synthesis occurred within psychiatry, driven in good part by basic science. First of all, there was a sort of a philosophical synthesis when cognitive psychology, the science of the mind, merged with neuroscience, the science of the brain, to formulate a new science of mind. And as we discussed in the earlier series, the fundamental assumption of the new science of mind is that every mental process, from the most trivial one, hitting a golf ball, to the most sophisticated, elaborative, creative acts, are all mediated by the brain. And of course, psychiatrists began to realize that all mental disorders, addictive disorders, must be brain mediated. This was further advanced by two other major <coughs> advances in the field. Uh, one was, uh, beginning with Franz Kohlmann around 1950, people began to realize that all of these disorders have a genetic basis. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, strengthened the biological underpinnings of it. And finally, imaging techniques came available, uh, which Nora and Tom are going to speak about, that made it possible to visualize, even with addictive and psychiatric disorders, areas in the brain that are functionally disturbed. So now we realize that these are biological disorders, and what we need to understand is three things. What, what do genes contribute? What do development contribute? What do environmental factors contribute? And Corey, who's pioneered in studying how genes affect behavior, is going to show us how we can approach that using animal models. So we're in for a terrific discussion.